you can either be in obedience, trust God for the finances, trust God with what he's doing in your life, or you can live in disobedience. That's really what it comes down to. From Tri-State Bible College and the Appalachian Ministry Institute, this is the Level Paths Podcast. My name is Chris Weigel, and we're glad you've taken some time to join us. Previously on Episode 2, Rex and Matt described how their Appalachian upbringing was woven into the stories of how they both became pastors. And if you missed it, (laughs) you might want to go back and listen. This is the third part of the introduction to the Level Paths podcast. And on this episode, what are some of the ins and outs to look for when a young man feels called to preach? What does obedience look like and what is there to look out for? Well, Rex and Matt continue by explaining that there are two types of people, the young men who have been called to preach and the church community who gets behind them with prayer and support. I'm so grateful for grace. You know, the Bible says that we're going to give an account. We're going to be judged for every idle word. And there is so much heresy that comes out of a young preacher's mouth that I'm so, I'm so grateful now for God's grace. I'm grateful that I can look at that and say, okay, the Lord gives grace for those who are learning. And so do congregations. Amen. And that's something we should say is that the congregations that put up with us in our early days as preacher boys, God bless them. And, and even now, and even now, <laughs> now uh, that's right. Uh, there's so much theological practice that goes on in any given church where these faithful saints, men and women who have served the Lord faithfully for years. No, they don't have a college degree. They don't have a Bible college degree. They've not gone to seminary, but they have listened to faithful preaching and some not so faithful. And they've learned and they've grown. They've taught Sunday school. They've taught in their small groups. They filled in for the pastor if necessary. They've listened to the songs, and those songs contain theology, not all of it good, but they have that that developed. And then a young man gets in front of them, and he's going to lead them by explaining God's word to them. And yet they respond with grace most of the time. They respond with kindness. And one of the things that's touched me so much is they respond with prayer. I know that some of the greatest prayer warriors I know have been little ladies in the church, some of, many of which have gone to heaven. But anytime I was out preaching a revival or whatever, those ladies were there. And I'm so grateful for them. We can name them by name. And that is true. And you said a little bit ago, something I want to touch on again. It's this James chapter three, let not many of you become teachers. And James goes on into the reasons for which, you know, there will be the stricter judgment gives the imagery of the fire, of the horse, of the helmsman and the ship's rudder, the image of the spring and how difficult it is. We've tamed everything else, every animal on the earth we can tame, but the tongue. And it's in the context of the teacher. When an Appalachian young man feels a call to ministry and they have the idea that they're going to go get training in the Bible and in theology and in ministry skills, someone discourages them because you're not going to make any money doing that. Or this idea of coming back to the Holy Spirit, you don't need to go get a degree in that because the Holy Spirit will take care of you when you get in the pulpit. And I encountered that at first, you know, my family's really happy now with how my life has turned out, what God's done. But at first I switched from chemistry pre-med. I mean, I made it all the way through organic chemistry and passed. And then I felt the call to ministry so strong that I wanted to go to Bible college and it was really discouraged. And when you have these young people who feel a call to ministry, many times the economic discouragement can prevent us from going on and getting training. It can. And you hear that. You hear that it's almost like a plight if a man's sensing God's call to ministry, that it almost becomes like a plight to the family that he's going to go do that. A lot of times in Appalachia, we have bivocational pastors. They're working whatever the job may be, anywhere from a janitor to a medical doctor. Those guys end up not getting the education necessary. Now, some, they just buy the books and go after it, but that's not always the case. Paul writes to Timothy in his last letter, and he said 
to him this, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's really what we're trying to do at Tri-State Bible College, is we're trying to commit these to faithful men who will teach others also. And we have them in all walks of life. We've had medical doctors who have come, God's called them to ministry and they want to be better equipped. We've had guys who work for the state road come and want to be better equipped. Guys who have never been to college come. And the reason they're doing that is because they want to more faithfully preach and teach God's word. And I'm grateful for that. One of the founders of Southern Seminary and one of the early forefathers of the Southern Baptist Convention, John Broadus, he was Robert E. Lee's chaplain for the Army of Northern Virginia, makes this statement. A young man learns to preach by preaching. It's not the worst thing in the world to do, to put a young man up there to preach. When he's called to preach, I'm called to preach. And if he continues, if he's persistent in that, he's going to preach. That's what God's called him to do. What I often do is if a young man says he's called to preach, I don't do anything unless he remains persistent. And then if he remains persistent, I try to find that flame yeah. and get him preaching. It's a very quick road to the need of education and maybe not formal. Maybe it's informal education, but the need to grow simply by getting in front of a congregation of people that you love and respect and who are being gracious to you by listening to you. You quickly learn how much you don't know and how much education that you actually need to carry out that task. Ministry is not about the money. Ministry is all about the call of God. And the truth of the matter is, you can either be in obedience, trust God for the finances, trust God with what he's doing in your life, or you can live in disobedience. That's really what it comes down to. All those moms and dads who may be listening to this, your son may say, I'm called to ministry. Your daughter may say, I'm called to ministry. She may be a missionary. She may work in, in incredible ways. And you discourage them. Remember what you're actually doing. You're actually encouraging them to be disobedient to the call of God on their life. If God's at work in them, who are you to stop it? You're not going to stop it. And so fan that flame, help them be equipped. I can tell you, so my parents, they were not people who were walking with the Lord when I sensed a call for ministry, but my dad, God had blessed him with a good job. And he was convinced that God had given him of the, all the reasons that he had that job. He was convinced that God had given him that good job in order to pay for my school. And so I went away to Liberty University, walked away from there, not owing a nickel because my dad was committed to that. And that's not beyond what many of the people maybe who will listen to this podcast need to be doing. Maybe they need to pay somebody's way to try state Bible college. Or maybe that local church needs to be a part of that as well. That that local church says, hey, we so much believe in the call of God on your life that we're going to help you get your schooling. Well, one of the things, brother, that after 18, going on 19 years of ministry that I want to help people do, especially young people mm -hmm. and their families or, or parents, I want to help them imagine all that God can do. Mm -hmm. Let's not limit the Lord. I mean, I can't believe some of the things I've gotten to do. You know, I'm 39 years old. You know, I'm only halfway done. And I look back and I think, I can't believe it. I can't yeah. believe some of the things. I think families and, and young people, when they sense the call of God, there's a sense of awesomeness about it. And I use that word in its actual meaning. There's a terror to it. There's also a glory to it. And you don't know what to do. I think one of the things that we're uniquely positioned to do is to help people imagine what all God can do. Let's figure it out. You've got this call on your life. Let's try to figure out. God's going to take care of you. Let's try to figure out what your ministry is going to look like and how you can fulfill it. You know, imagine we're going to trust God with our eternity, but we're not going to trust God with our paycheck. That's a crazy idea. Just believe God that he, if he's called you to ministry, that he's going to provide for you. And no, you know, you said this earlier and we can't do this enough. Maybe God is not calling you to be a fully funded pastor by your church. Maybe God's calling you to be faithful in whatever occupation he's called you to so that you can be faithful in the ministry that he's called you to. 
And so you may be a pastor. The pastor of the church that I pastor right now was a bivocational pastor every day of his ministry. He worked at the gas company and led this church from about 50 people to 1,500 people in the period of 30 years. He served here faithfully. God called him right here to his hometown, and God blessed his ministry in incredible ways. And here's what's so important to remember. God rewards faithfulness, and the measure of our ministry is not the number of the people in the pew, but the measure of our ministry is faithfulness to the task. You may not be the keynote speaker. I may not be Billy Graham. But in all of that, there are pastors who are listening to this who have far more ministry experience than you and I do even combined. And I'm so grateful for those men. I'm grateful for their faithfulness. I'm grateful for what God has done in them and what God is currently doing through them. I'm grateful for that. And I hope that at Tri-State Bible College, we can just fan that flame. You know, it's incredible. We had a brother in this past year, he went to be with the Lord, Leo Skaggs. Leo was a public school teacher. He taught college and he taught at our Bible college and he taught pastoral ministry. And our graduate program, Leo signed up for that at 92 years old. He signed up for our graduate program. And Leo had pastored for something like 60 years, I believe. Well, I'm 43, so I've not been alive for 63 years. I thought, here's Leo in my class, and my father was 10 years old when Leo started pastor, okay? And I remember coming into the class, and there's Leo, and Leo not only had a master's degree in English, but Leo also had pastored all these years, and I thought, what on earth am I going to teach him? What could I possibly teach him? And what I found very quickly with Leo is that Leo was a godly man. And that though I may not have thought that I could teach Leo anything, Leo was going to learn from me because he was a godly man and he was there to learn. Now, I remember him turning in his papers. Here's a 92-year-old man turning in typed papers that were impeccable in almost every possible way. But Leo learned from me, and I have to say, I learned so much from Leo, and I was the one teaching the class because 60 years of pastoral ministry, and here I am teaching a class on ministry in Appalachia to the man who should have been teaching me. There's so many guys out there like that. Leo never pastored a massive church, but Leo was faithful to his church. He was a godly, godly, godly man. What an incredible blessing he was to our Bible college. He was an incredible blessing to this professor, this brother. I miss him dearly. But I think that that's what the Appalachian Ministry Institute is going to do. We're going to hear about not just what the research that we find, the results of that, but we're going to hear about guys who are practicing ministry right now and how God's blessing them. And it's not because necessarily they have the degrees on the wall. It's because they have put their hand to the plow and they have remained faithful. Amen. Well, brother, so there's a passage that comes to mind that is behind the name of the podcast, which is Level Paths. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 and in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, we see the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament. And that Old Testament passage is Isaiah 40. In Isaiah 40, the Lord is telling about a highway that he is going to make. But in order for that highway to be made, some mountains got to be leveled and some valleys got to be lifted up. The reason is, unless those structures, those topographical structures are changed, you won't see the glory of the Lord. And the Lord wants all flesh to see his glory. And now Mark says that, the glory of the Lord will be seen. And then Luke says that the salvation of the Lord will be seen. And what, you know, what we find is that the glory and the salvation are in one person that comes on the scene. Yes. There <laughs> it's we go. the Lord Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist's ministry was a ministry of repentance. He was calling people to repentance. And I think what was happening in that ministry was that the mountains and the valleys and the hearts were being leveled yeah, so that they could see Jesus, so that repentance would come, get rid of the obstacles, and prepare a way for the Lord. 
to come and people would see his glory. They would see his salvation. And that's what we're trying to do. The conversations that we're going to have on this podcast is trying to, to the best of our ability and with the Holy Spirit's help is to remove obstacles to ministry in Appalachia, mountains and valleys. And so that people can see the glory of the Lord in Appalachia. A lot of Appalachia preachers are pretty unique guys. And I think about that passage that you're talking about. I think about John the Baptist. Have you seen this mini series, The Chosen? I'm going to be honest. I was so reluctant to watch this because as a guy that's Bible college professor, it's hard not to look at it through that lens, but it's really good. What I've seen of it so far has been really good. And they refer to John the Baptist when the disciples start coming to faith in Christ. Here's this guy who's preparing the way, you know, the one crying out in the wilderness. They refer to John the Baptist as creepy John. And I think, What a great way to think about John the Baptist, creepy John, because here is this, the last of the Old Testament prophets. We could say he's a New Testament prophet, but really he's right there in the middle. And the actions, the way he dresses, what he does, he lives out in the woods, creepy John. You know, there's a lot of guys in Appalachia, maybe they would even say you and I, who would fit the creepy John moniker, but God's using them. What God is doing in Appalachia. I believe is preparing the way, just like you said, for something great. People have noticed that there's something different, that there's something different in ministry in Appalachia. And now guys are starting to look at that. People are starting to write on it. There are dissertations being written on it. Pastors are starting to study this. Books are being written. Podcasts are coming out. And I'm excited about that. All of that is going to focus that attention on genuine gospel ministry in Appalachia. That's really what you're talking about there genuine gospel ministry from guys like Creepy Rex and Creepy Matt. (laughs) God wants to call men in Appalachia from every walk of life to prepare the way. And maybe that's you. Or maybe you're in a place where you can support that young man or men in your church who are called to preach the word. That's what Tri-State Bible College and the Appalachian Ministry Institute are here for. Tri-State Bible College equips shepherds, servants, and stewards to fulfill their ministries in Christ's commission by offering access to a community of biblical scholarship, resulting in lives that glorify God through theological discernment, biblical and contextual intelligence, spiritual devotion, and ministry competence. That's the mission of Tri-State Bible College, and if you'd like to find out more, visit tsbc.edu. If you're a pastor, or maybe you're at a church in the Appalachian region and you're looking for more effective ways to minister to the people right where you are, you can reach out to Rex Howe and Matt Shamlin at Tri-State Bible College by emailing rex.how at tsbc.edu or matt.shamlin at tsbc.edu. And again, if you'd like more information about Tri-State Bible College and the Appalachian Ministry Institute, visit tsbc.edu. On the next Level Paths podcast, what happens when God calls you to serve in a place that you never thought you'd go? That was my initiation, leaving Florida, running a business, a multi-million dollar business with 52 employees, to then taking the small church, ending up on welfare, and it was welcome to ministry. And I realized right then and there that God calls you for a divine purpose. And if we would just focus and if we would just trust him, he will lead us through. The one thing that I have taken throughout this whole process is that if I keep on saying yes, God will provide. And every time I've tried to do it Desmond's way, that's when I've got myself in trouble. The Level Paths Podcast is an outreach of Tri-State Bible College and the Appalachian Ministry Institute. 